I think that really blesses him because there's so many people in the world that are discontent and every one of us, even those of you who may think you're poor, <laughs> we have so much compared to what they have in the rest of the world that it's just... And, you know, we think all the time, but we need to think more about how blessed we are. I mean, seriously, we need to think more about just how blessed we are and what God has done for us. And uh, just, just even the medical things that are available to us today. It's just, well, we're blessed. And I just think it'd be good if we'd all go out of here this afternoon just pretty much determined to have a good attitude, to work with God about this thing about maintaining a humble attitude, and believe me, that's a lifelong pursuit. I set a goal today, and my goal is if I remember, I'll let you know next year if I've made any progress. <laughs> My goal is every time Dave gives me advice is to say thank you. <laughs> Ooh, it's going to take a lot. Amen? Wow. And I, I think it would just be great if we'd go out determined to be content. And you know, we can't do any of this by ourselves. We've, God's got to help us, but uh, Paul said in Philippians 4, 11 and 12, now I'm not implying that I was in any personal want, for I have learned how to be content. So it apparently wasn't something he always knew, it was something he had to learn. And so it's okay if we're still learning it. And I definitely, even in the beginning of my ministry, I was just discontent all the time because I wanted it to be bigger than what it was. And I was just frustrated because it wasn't growing. And something that I missed, you know, we often think about what would I do over if I could go back and do it again. And something that I would like to save you from is try to be really happy where you're at on the way to where you're going. And I love, I love what Paul said, or the Amplified Bible says about contentment. Contentment doesn't mean that you never want anything. It's not wrong to want things. But if we do want something, we need to ask God for it and then be content with when and how he gives it to us and enjoy where we're at while we're waiting for God to do the next thing. I want to tell you something, and this is important. You, I've caught myself at different times just being a little bit discontent and not really knowing what it was about. And, I know I'm blessed and so I shouldn't be discontent and I didn't understand and God showed me something that helped me and, and I wanted to help you. There's going to be a part of you that no matter what you ever have or don't have that's not going to be fully content because this is not your home. The Bible says that we groan inwardly waiting for the full redemption of our bodies and waiting for Christ to come. This is not our home. We're just passing through, waiting to get home. So there's a spiritual part of us that's never going to be completely satisfied until we are with Jesus and home. Amen? And thank God we can't be satisfied with this world. I, I, it's just... I'm really, the older I get, the more I'm looking forward to what God's going to have when I'm on the other side. I'm not saying I want to die, but I'm getting, you get a little more curious the older you get, well, what's it really going to be like? And so Paul said, 
I must start over. Not that I'm implying that I was in any personal want, because I've learned how to be content, satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed or disquieted in whatever state I'm in. So I love that. Contentment doesn't mean I never want anything. It's not wrong to want things. It's wrong to be unhappy if you don't get them. I'm going to say it again. It's not wrong to want things, but it's wrong to be unhappy if you don't get them because really what that's saying is, God, I don't trust you. Because <laughs> see, we ask him to be in charge of our lives and I've kind of come to the point of realizing that if I ask God for something and he doesn't give it to me, that it's either, I either didn't ask for the right thing, it's not the right time, our God has got something much better for me and I'm just not smart enough not to ask for it yet. One thing I can tell you is God is never holding out on you. Trust me when I tell you when the time is right and the thing is right, nothing and nobody will keep God from giving you what he wants you to have. Amen. And so we want to be satisfied where we're at. Don't, don't waste your life being unhappy where you are because you're always trying to get to the next thing and the next place. Keep pressing toward those things. We don't want to be passive and idle and just sit around and not do anything or ever want anything, but God wants us to be happy, and I think that he wants us to be thankful. If you ever want God to give you anything else, you have to learn to be thankful for what you have. <laughs> Philippians 4, 6 says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Continue to make your wants known to God, and the peace that passes understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So I was praying one day for something, and God said, why should I give you that? You're already complaining about what you got. <laughs> so see, if we're complaining about what we have, getting something else won't stop us from complaining. We'll find something else to complain about. And Paul said, I know how to be abased and live humbly in straitened circumstances. He means I know how to not have what I want and be happy. And I know also how to enjoy plenty and live in abundance. There's a, two tests we have with money. The Lord put this on my heart one time. There's two tests that you're gonna have concerning money. One, how you act when you don't have any. And two, how you act when you have a lot. When you don't have any, God wants you to be content to wait on him and for wherever you're at, be as generous as you can be. And when you have plenty, God doesn't want you to get selfish and keep it all for yourself. He wants you to have your needs met, but he wants you to be very generous. And there's a spirit that we deal with in our life that we have to fight against all the time, and it's a spirit of greed. And sometimes we think, well, if I just had this, I'd be happy. And if I just had that, I'd be happy. No, you got to get happy where you're at. I tried to think seriously about this because I don't like to preach stuff that just sounds preachy but doesn't work for people. So what would this message sound like to somebody who maybe has a husband that's on drugs or a child that's in a lot of trouble, and I'm telling you, be happy where you're at on the way to where you're going and be content. And how can you do that? Sometimes we'll have people write in and say, how can I be content when I have this situation or that situation? Well, I don't know that I have your full answer, but I think I have part of it. And part of it is to not focus all the time on what you don't have. They like it better than you guys. a lot of times we just whatever you focus on gets bigger and you, you can actually think so much about your problem 
that you really do make it bigger than what it is. And I'd like to be able to tell you to try to go ahead and enjoy your life. See, if you're living with somebody or married to somebody who, who has a problem, if you let their problem make you unhappy, then you've become codependent on them. That's what codependency is. I have to wait and see every day how you're gonna be before I can decide if I'm gonna be happy. Come on now. You can either listen to me or you can go pay a psychologist a hundred bucks to tell you this. <laughs> codependency is a big thing. And how many times do you get up and it's a good sunny day and you've got a nice plan and all of a sudden one of your kids does something and now all of a sudden you've lost your joy. We cannot be codependent on other people. Let me repeat again. If you're involved with somebody who has a problem and you have to wait and see what they're going to do that day before you can decide whether or not you're going to be happy, then you're codependent on them. My, my family was actually a real mess. I just, that's just all you can say. My dad was a sexual abuser. There was a spirit of incest in his family bloodline and he wasn't the only one who abused me. I had a couple of uncles who did and a grandfather who tried and my mom was just afraid. My dad was a pretty mean, scary person. He'd get drunk, come home at night and beat her up. And, you know, I don't know why she stayed with him, but women back then did, you know. Today, if I was married to somebody like him, I'd put up with it about 10 minutes. And uh, Now, I'm not telling you if you got a husband, but you know, my mother knew that my father was abusing me and she stayed with him. And that, to be honest, it was hard, it's been harder for me to deal with what she did than what he did. And she was extremely codependent on him. Just thought she couldn't live without him, couldn't make it without him. And let me tell you something, what you, all you really need is God. You don't. You listen, you don't let somebody abuse your kids and abuse you and stay with them because you're afraid you can't make it. Uh-uh. God will take care of you and there are places that will help you and take care of you. You are too precious and you're worth too much to let somebody abuse you. Amen? And so, my dad was an abuser, my mother was afraid of everything. I had one brother, nine years younger than me, and of course, he was brought up weird like me, except he wasn't sexually abused, but he never really had a father. And he went in the Marines when he was 17, got in the Vietnam War, and ended up getting on drugs over in the jungles of Vietnam, and just for whatever reason was just never able to get free from them. He just. He was the nicest guy, good looking, but he was extremely irresponsible. And they say a lot of times when somebody starts taking a lot of drugs when they're young that they, they kind of stay at that place in life and they never grow mentally beyond that. So you might have a 50 year old that still acts like a 13 year old or a 17 year old and he just was very irresponsible he married a girl and they had a baby but he never would take care of the child and he never would pay child support and he just he'd disappear for years at a time and then he'd show back up and want somebody to clean his mess up and he called us and we hadn't seen him for about eight years and he wanted to I'm ready to say, sis, can I come home? I want to get my life straightened out. Okay, so we brought him back and he lived with us for four years and we thought 
he got off the drugs. I'm not sure now that he ever did completely. And uh, he may have for a while, but he had to be, you had to babysit him all the time to keep him going in the right direction. Anybody know what I'm dealing, talking about, you know? Um, and so, he got good enough that we let him work on the road with us and his teeth were all bad because of the drugs and we got all of his teeth fixed and got him nice new clothes and got him a new truck and he did okay as long as somebody was standing right on top of him watching him. Get up, David. Time to go to work, David. <laughs> But he couldn't seem to manage to take care of himself. And so after about four years, we felt like it was time for him to get out and stand on his own two feet. So we got him furniture, got him in an apartment. And sure enough, as soon as he was out on his own, he started going right back to the same stuff again. And uh, he actually was kind of schizophrenic and got paranoid from all the drugs and Thought he had bugs crawling under his skin and all kinds of stuff and and uh, we got him all the help that we could get him we got him in a treatment program <laughs> we, we did everything that we could possibly do and after about six years I realized that his life was eating mine up and I just said I can't do it anymore I'm I'm not gonna do it anymore I have a call on my life, I've got a life to live, and I am not going to be codependent on his problem. Amen? And um, so he left again for about eight years, and then he called again, wanted to get his life straightened out, yada, yada, yada. So we sent him to a treatment program out in Los Angeles, somebody that we knew, and he got clean again. And, and then one day he just told them, he said, you guys are great and I appreciate all you've done, but this is just not for me. I want you to just take me to the VA. Well, the reason he wanted to go there was to get pain pills. And this is sad, but long story short, he ended up committing suicide. He hung himself in an abandoned building out in Los Angeles. Now, I was tempted for about half an hour to feel like, well, it was my fault. You know, I should have taken care of him. But you know what? It wasn't my fault. We gave him every opportunity. And I don't, I, I didn't plan at all to go in this direction, but maybe there's somebody here today that needs to hear this, I don't know. You know, you just, you, you can't, don't feel guilty because somebody else wants to ruin their life. You can pray for them, you can try to help them, but you have a life to live and God's got a plan for you. And I'm just telling you, don't let somebody else with a problem steal your life. Now, I'm not saying please help them, do all you can for them, pray for them, but all you can do is give people opportunity. Come on, somebody needs this. All you can do is give people opportunity, and if they won't take it, and it's tough, especially if it's your kids. Now, that was my brother, and that was hard enough, but I know for some of you, it's your kids, and I, I can't tell you what to do. Only you know what you can do, but... I'm just telling you, the Bible says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus said, I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. And so don't let somebody else destroy your life because they want to destroy theirs. Anyway. Contentment does not come from possessions. Positions or power. Contentment comes from within. Contentment comes from being in right relationship to God.
you cannot have hidden sin in your life and be content. You may have things from your past that you need to sit and talk with somebody about that you've kept hidden for years and years and years. You won't be content until you deal with it. The more you hide from things, the more they're going to chase you. Here again, somebody needs to hear me. You can walk away from the physical problem, but still take it with you in your soul. My soul was wounded. That's why that book that I wrote, Healing the Soul of a Woman, is so important for people that have been hurt in the past. You need to let the Holy Spirit into those places of pain in your life and let him give you direction on how you should go about getting healing. I never did get any professional counseling, first of all, I couldn't have afforded it, but I got mine from God and reading books and just going through things myself. And, but there's not a thing wrong with getting counseling if that's what you need. If you need to take medicine for a period of time, there's nothing wrong with that. I personally am really fed up with Christians acting like if you need some kind of medicine for your mental health that you're a nut and have a problem. I'm tired of that. I take medicine for anxiety and I, you know, for a long time I didn't want anybody to know that because I'm a faith person. Well, I don't care. If you were raised like I was, you'd have some anxiety too. <laughs> Amen? And not only that, I've got a little tumor on my adrenal glands which causes my hormones to go a little bit nutty. And you just got, you got to get the help you need. Don't abuse medicine. Don't let that be your first go-to every time you have a rough day. We don't, want, we don't want to just, you know, there was some kind of a show on the other day. My daughter said that this doctor was on. He said 85% of people that take anxiety medicine really don't need it. They could get their problem solved another way. And I do believe that. There's a lot of people that's just the doctors just hand that stuff out and that's not what you want to do. But if that's what you really need, then there's no shame. Are you listening to me today? <laughs> taking medicine for anxiety is no different than taking medicine if you got diabetes, you know? Your nerves, your mental health is a part of you just like any other part of you. And but you have to get those issues resolved. You can't just hide from the things that are hurting you. And you know, sexual abuse in particular is especially shaming. Of all the abuse, they say sexual abuse is the worst. And you usually feel bad about yourself and somehow or another you feel like it was your fault and it's not. If an adult abuses you, it's not your fault that they did. Amen? And if your spouse is unfaithful, it's not your fault. It doesn't mean you weren't enough or there was something wrong with you. When somebody else has a problem, don't take it on yourself. Let them deal with their problems. Amen? You can never be content if you have issues that need to be dealt with and you just keep pushing them away and pushing them away and pushing them away. Just do it afraid if you have to, but get it over with and get it out of your life. You hear me? Get it over with. Do it and get it over with. And if you're here today and you haven't given your life to Christ yet, you can forget ever being happy. You just, I don't 
I don't care what you own or what kind of position you have or who you know, you will not ever be happy without God in your life because you were created by him, for him. And I will go a little bit further and say, if you've got one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world, you're not going to be happy with that either. So if you're half in and half out, today's the day to get fully committed. Amen? I mean, fully committed. You've got to get on God's program because he's not going to get on yours. Contentment is a result of righteousness, right standing with God. And yes, the Bible says that we are made right with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. He gives us righteousness, but then he, we're supposed to work with the Holy Spirit to work that out of us and turn it into right behavior. We're made right with God, but our behavior has to catch up with that. God gives us everything that we need, a seed of everything we need on the inside of us to be everything he's asked us to be. He wouldn't ask us to do right if he didn't give us righteousness. Discontentment means to be unhappy, not satisfied, or to have a sense of resentment. And listen to this, discontented people resent people who have what they want. And many times we'll get judgmental. Well, they don't need a house that big. <laughs> well, you shouldn't have spent money on You don't need a swimming pool. <laughs> you don't need to drive a car like that. I've never had anybody be jealous of anything I have if they have one too. Come on. Now, there's a little something in the Bible called greed. And greed is not a little problem, it's a big problem. And we have to fight it just like we fight the temptation to other sins. And greedy just says more, more, more. I just want more. And believe me, the society we live in today is a more society. I've already got 25, but I want another one. More. And the Bible has some very interesting things to say about greed, and they're not very pretty. Proverbs 1.19 so are the ways of everyone who is greedy of gain. Such greed takes away the life of its possessor. In other words, you can't be greedy and be happy and live the life that Jesus died for you to live. Now listen, we are born selfish, but we're born again generous. We're born greedy, but we're born again a giver. When you can get beyond selfishness and really become an aggressive, generous giver, the joy you'll have is just absolutely wonderful. But we, gotta, we, we have to conquer that greed first. The first there's that, what about me? Well, you know, why should I give away everything I've worked for? Well, there's joy in giving. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And I'm not just talking about giving money into the offering. I, don't worry, I'm not taking another offering here today. I'm not trying to get your money. I'm talking about living a life of generosity. In every way from how you tip your waiters and waitresses, in every way, be generous. Be generous with compliments. Be generous with smiles. In every way, be generous. 
We were sitting in the back room today during the lunch break and I just happened to say something about my purse. I said, I've had that purse seven years and I need a new one, but I, I'm looking for a certain kind. I, I, don't, I don't like a purse that doesn't zip up. I want pockets, you know, certain things. Well, about an hour later, here comes Ginger back from the coach store with a purse, just exactly like what I wanted. And I have looked for three years and couldn't find a purse like that. And see, I'm telling you, if, if you will be generous and not be greedy, God will get to you what he wants you to have. Come on. And God doesn't want us trying to get everything for ourselves. He wants us to live to make other people happy. Then he'll work through other people to make you happy. This is a brand new way of living. And it's a new way for a lot of Christians. There's so many people in the world that don't know how to receive. And there's a lot of, yeah, not me either. You don't want to offer me something because I'm taking it. I'm a good giver and I'm a good receiver. Amen. I cannot stand that when I try to give somebody something and they give me this, it's really phony, like, oh, no, 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 no. It's like, you know you want it, why not just take it and say thank you? Not that false humility, oh, no, 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 no. I, I hate that. Sometimes if I want to give somebody something, I'll have somebody else give it to them because I don't want to go through that. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And you know, we have, we all have kind of special areas in our life. I buy people dogs. Now don't write me and ask me for a dog. But I had a dog for 12 years and loved her so much, just, and it was a different time in my life. I had a lot of people in positions to help me, and I've tried like four other times since then to have a dog, and it just, my lifestyle and dog just don't go together right now. And so I've bought and given away four dogs. <laughs> and so now, I just, I like to buy dogs, so when people, when I hear of somebody who wants a dog, I'm like, I'm, I'm your person. I have a lot of dogs named after me. A girl at work, I bought her a dog, she named it Hamish J. So. <laughs> so I tell you, I'm so seed, and one of these days I'm gonna have the dog I want. Amen. I'd like one that doesn't pee or poop. If anybody's got one like that, I'll take it. Oh my gosh, the last dog I had, he was so sweet, his name was Duke. But I get up really early in the morning, like, I mean, sometimes 4 a.m. So it's dark outside at 4 a.m. Of course, you gotta take Duke to the bathroom. And I locked myself out of the house. And I had on spaghetti strap pajamas. And I could not wake Dave up. I didn't have my phone. I didn't have my key. I couldn't call anybody. I couldn't get in. I had to go to a neighbor's house at 4 a.m. in my pajamas. And I barely knew this woman. And she looked at me like, what, what's wrong? I said, can I use your phone? I locked myself out of my house, taking my dog to the bathroom. I thought. I don't know why I told you that story. Anyway. A greedy spirit stirs up conflict. 
but those who trust in the Lord will prosper. You can ask God for anything you want to ask him for, but don't get discontent if you don't get it the way you want it when you want it. Amen. Greed must be a very serious problem because in 1 Corinthians 5.11, Paul said, now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister in Christ, but is sexually immoral, we get that, an idolater, we get that, a drunkard, we get that, or greedy, or a slanderer, or a swindler. Well, how many Christians slander other people and don't think anything at all about it? Must be a problem. Let me ask you a question. How many grouchy, cranky, complaining, ungrateful people do you hang out with? <laughs> oh, you're looking at me like... You know why Paul says that we must not hang out with them? Because whatever's on people is going to get on you. Let me tell you, the spirit on them is going to get on you. You listen to me all the time and you'll start sounding just like me. I've had, I've had people say, my husband said I sound just like you. Well, yeah, you, whatever, you know, you, you listen to somebody a lot or you're around somebody a lot you're gonna take on some of their traits. I always tell people you can hang out with unbelievers as long as you're affecting them and they're not infecting you. We don't wanna ignore unbelievers, they need us, but we gotta make sure that we're not taking on what they're trying to give away. Amen? So be careful. Greed is a demon spirit. There's nothing the devil hates worse than generosity. There's nothing he hates worse than people who fund the preaching of the gospel. Amen? That's why we've got all this weirdness today with people's attitude about offerings and You know, you've got to be careful now not to say the word prosperity, is that? Well, I looked the other day, it's, the word prosperity is in the Bible 121 times. So what's wrong with me saying it? God wants you to prosper. And that does not make me a name it, claim it preacher online that says I'm a prosperity preacher. That is stupid. That is not all I preach about. It's a very little part of what I preach about. I preach about spiritual maturity. The devil just can't stand it if you tell people that God wants to bless them. The devil wants you to have nothing so you cannot give anything. Now I'm getting mad. you go people talk to you about money and you expect it why is it that church is the only place people get mad about it <laughs> well all you do is talk about money well honey if you had my bills you might say a little bit about money too <laughs> and we don't we don't really ask people for anything you know why God takes care of us we don't have any debt You know why? Because our ministry is a giving ministry and God meets our needs. We take care of the poor and he meets our needs. Mm. Having a good time. Giving is so much fun. Just get your sweet little mind off yourself long enough. Listen to what people say. People will tell you what they want and need. I wasn't on purpose trying to tell Ginger I needed a purse. We were just talking, but she heard me. 
and she took action. And that's what I do. I listen to what people say, and then I take action. God told me a long time ago, he said, stop asking me to do things that you could do and just don't want to. Oh God, Susie Q at work, her mattress is 30 years old. She needs a new mattress. Would you help her get a new mattress? He's like, get her one yourself. You can afford it. <laughs> Do you hear me? Some of you are kind of tuning out right now. It's like. <laughs> yeah. Make the devil mad. Generosity is spiritual warfare. You know that? Well, you know, I can't, can't give all my money away. Nobody's telling you to give it all away. I'm just saying be generous. <laughs> if you're a tither, don't do like $12.31. I mean, at least be generous enough to round it off to the next dollar. Ooh, I'm going to get myself in trouble if I don't get out of here. Come on, let's, let's look at, let's get brave. Let's look at Malachi 3. 10 and 11. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there might be food in my house. In other words, wherever you want to do your eating, that's where you need to do your giving. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. Wow. I'm glad he doesn't say, test me and see if I'll just put a little crack in the door so a little bit will dribble out to you. He says, no, I'll throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much that there won't be room enough for you to take it in. And I will prevent the pest from devouring your crops. Well, I had ants all over my sink this morning. I said, God, what? Get rid of those pests. <laughs> now, you know, a lot of people say, well, you, you can't. Tithing is under the law. Well, I won't argue with you about it if that's what you want to say, but I'll just say this. If they could tithe under the law, what, would we, what should we be doing by grace? No, don't tithe, do more. <laughs> Besides that, Jesus talked about tithing. God says to even bless your enemies. Listen, if you're jealous of somebody and you just cannot seem to get over it, I'll tell you how to get over it. Go buy them a present. I'm not joking. <laughs> Matthew 5:43, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You know, in the Old Testament, they got to hate people. We don't get to do that. <laughs> I mean, David prayed some wicked stuff on some of his enemies. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And when you give to those who have not treated you right, this is me saying this, you confuse and defeat the enemy. I mean, wh what's he gonna do with you if you give to your enemies? 
<laughs> Some of you are probably thinking of a few people right now you need to give to, and you're like, this is going to be expensive. Do you know how hard it was for me when God told me to take care of my mom and dad until they died? When he first put that on my heart, I rebuked it. I thought it was the devil. I said, there is no way that God would ask me to do that. Oh, yes, he will. Yeah, he will. You say, well, that's not fair. Well, I ask him to do a lot of things for me that's not fair that I don't deserve. And he does them. Seek to be good to other people. <laughs> you know, if God asks you to do something for somebody, don't be the kind of person who needs three prophecies and an appearance of angels. And... <laughs> now, God, if this is really you, <laughs> I mean, God, if it's really you, give me a confirmation, God, if it's really you. You know what? Even if it's not really God, he'll never get mad at you for blessing somebody. So I stopped all that nonsense a long time ago. I said, I'll tell you what, God, I'm not, you don't have to prove to me that you want me to bless people. I'm just going to bless everybody unless you tell me not to. How's that? Let's turn a corner and do a new thing. Let's make the devil mad. Well, I'll end with this and give you something to think about. First of all, generosity is a weapon. There's a few of you in here that know what I'm talking about. Maybe not everybody does, but there's a few of you. You know what? Hiding all your money in a bank somewhere is not going to make you happy. And I'm not saying don't save money. You should save money. You should be prepared for your future. My husband has a great plan on giving. Out of everything you get, you should save some, spend some, and give some. Nobody wants you to work and never spend any money on yourself. God never asked you to do that. I'm not talking about that. But don't keep it all. Save some, give some, spend some. We always say, boy, I wish we had the power that they had in the church in the book of Acts. Okay, you want that kind of power? Ananias and Sapphira kept what they said they would give and they dropped dead. Well, maybe I don't want that kind of power. <laughs> and you know how they lived? Everybody sold all their goods and they all brought the money to the apostles and everything was divided among everybody so nobody had need. Yeah, well, we probably don't want to live like that, do we? I'm not giving you what I work for. No, we shouldn't be giving people money who won't work and won't do their part. But we should be helping people that are doing the best they can and they're still hurting. Amen? And you know one of the things that's wrong with the church? We have now given the government the job of taking care of everybody. And have you ever considered this? They don't have anything to give anybody unless they first take it away from somebody else. Yeah, we'll help you, but we'll raise your taxes. Well, that's not right, because they give a lot of money to people who won't do nothing. They wouldn't take a job if you gave them 10. I'm talking about, I mean, God said if you won't work, you shouldn't eat. I'm talking about we should help people that are disenfranchised and they're, they're doing the best they can, but they need help. Amen? We should always help people like that. 
Well, I bet if we had about another week, we could get things straightened out, couldn't we? <laughs> I wrote a closing statement, I'll read it. The attitude of contentment has a voice. It says you trust God. It says you're thankful for what you have. Be content and satisfied with what you have and God will release more as he knows you're ready. Contentment is the doorway to happiness. It is spiritual warfare against the devil. If you are not content, then you are looking in all the wrong places for fulfillment. Remember that things cannot satisfy. Only God himself and being in his will can satisfy us completely. If you're not satisfied, don't seek anything the world has to offer.